Okio Mtata, the senator for Busia County. Happy New Year, Senator. Happy New Year to you. Good to see you. Thank you. Karibu sana. I'm so happy to see you. How was the festive season for you? I was lying low. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Chini ya maji. Me and my God. Yeah. In, in Busia or in Nairobi? Nairobi. Okay. I did not travel up country. Mm. Mm. Karibu sana, it's good to have you here. Asante. City will welcome you with the day's proverb. Listen to the proverb, it's in Kiswahili. We want you to translate it to English and then you give us your interpretation of that proverb. Our proverbs of the whole of this week come from the country of Kenya. Mm -hmm. The Republic. The Republic, the independent Republic country of Kenya. Mm -hmm. Okay. The multi-party country of Kenya. Si lazima kuzima taa ya mwenzako ili yako ionekane si lazima kuzima taa ya mwenzako ili yako ionekane yes lazima ndiposa yes <laughs> <laughs> senator what how would you translate this into english well i looks to be dealing with small rooms eh mm -hmm. when you talk mambo ya matai you talking about small room mm -hmm. But for me who engages in the, co in the cosmos, it is said that the stars are never bright when the moon is full. Mm. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the stars are never bright when the moon is full. <laughs> but they don't dim either way. No. They don't go off. <laughs> <laughs> What's your interpretation of it? Well, I think... Uh, it basically says that it's enough room for everybody. Yeah, so you don't need to pull somebody down to be seen to do anything. Hmm. Just do your thing. Do your thing. Yeah. There's enough for everybody to do. Okay. In the creation, sharing in the creation of God. Hmm. We are co-creators, so, and there's enough room for everybody. Right. So you don't need to cut somebody's feet down for you to succeed or to mad sling or to do whatever so it basically is a it's a it's a, a proverb that calls for harmony it's room for every like in an orchestra mm. all those voices all those instruments have a place mm. and if you had just one instrument you can't have an orchestra so you need all those things so i think that's what that is basically telling us mm. yeah interdependence yeah <laughs> and, and working relations synergy synergy synergies yeah Teamwork. It goes very well into our conversation. Then, in fact, in where you sit yeah. as uh, Okio Mtata, as a senator, and also as a defender of um, the public interest, do you feel that sometimes the three arms of government are trying to deem one another so they can remain like the the only ones that are shining? Uh, I think uh, what, I've, what, what I've tended to see is that it's the executive that takes to take, tries to get all the oxygen in the room and leave the others starving. Mm. So that's I think that's why the problem for me is is that uh, the executive, because it controls the past and it controls the means of violence, tends to want to behave like the only organ available mm. in the state. Like when you talk of the government, it is the government. And that's why even you realize that in more common literature you'll find the people referring to the executive as the government. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They never refer to the judiciary as the government or parliament as the government, but the executive is referred to as the government. Yet it, the, executive, the executive is just a branch of the government. Yeah. Recently we've had these conversations. In fact the president said Lazima Tuenam Jadala on this one on how we relate particularly with the judiciary we as the executive have a mandate direct mandate from the people we went campaigned and said we'd like to implement these programs and the people said yes 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 you are a person after our own hearts mm. and therefore go ye and implement those programs and then people like omtata and eric and others are going to court and halting them and well, first of all, uh, Kuna Mujadala. Yeah? You know, this guy is trying to be smart. Mm. You have the constitution, Mujadala Ganten. The separation of powers, Akuna Mujadala. That should come out very clear to the president, Akuna Mujadala. What do you mean? Mujadala Wanini. Everything he said is set down in the constitution. Mm -hmm. The executive has its role, 
the judiciary as well, parliament as its role, unless he wants us to subvert the constitution, to end the attempt to attend the constitution, and that's, uh, that's an invitation I'm not ready to take. Just implement the constitution. Is it possible that he's just basically just expressing frustration that yes, in this, in everybody playing their role, then there are those who are misusing another office. No, I don't think I don't think and misusing uh, the process of the court, which ends up undermining the job that I have to do. The president, the, the court is just an adjudicator. So you cannot say you are misusing the court unless you are going to say that the adjudicator is also complicit, which would require evidence that the, that the adjudicator is not impartial and, in, and independent. You need to demonstrate that that's the case. Otherwise, it doesn't mean that because you have got your agenda, somebody should not question it. Number two, the elections were not a referendum on the constitution. The elections chose a very small part of the state called government. Government is not the state. So, and the president needs to distinguish when he's a head of state and when he's a head of government. Because in Kenya, both are fused together. So government is a very, very small part of the Kenyan state. So the elections were not about the Kenyan state, were about who will run the Kenyan state. Not to undermine it, not to destroy it, or to whatever, but just to manage it well. Mm. They had an agenda, and the agenda has to be carried out within the provisions of the construction, the four walls of the constitution. Mm. You go out of that, you're not implementing the agenda because... The ultimate public interest is in the rule of law, is the law. Anything outside the law cannot serve the public. Mm. Senator, you talk about, you know, basically implementing the Constitution. Yes. If you look at Chapter 7 of the Constitution, representation of the people, that's one yes. of the things that you've, you know, I think held uh, quite closely to your heart in the different ways in which you've seen, we've seen you come through. Look at Chapter 7 specifically. How do we say that this plays out in the Kenya that we live in uh, from today, whereby the representation of the people has been subverted, as you say? How should it be according to what the words of Chapter 7 actually say? Well, Chapter 7 is about the representation of the people, how people get elected to occupy a political office in this country, especially at the national level and at the county level. One of the biggest tragedies that happened in this country is that uh, we have this constitution, which in some aspects is purely technical, in some aspects is what you'd expect in a constitution. Because of our unique history, certain things that should not be in a constitution were put there. You get something like, on, just to step aside a bit, mm -hmm. you'll get something like in a public procurement. Where would public procurement be in our constitution? Because our history has been is one of ma massively abu massive abuse. Yep. And I think the last time I counted, I had seen that in the, in the constitution of Morocco, South Africa, Kenya, and the Philippines. And if you look at the history of those countries, I've got issues. Mm. So there are pure, purely technical matters that were put in our constitution that require that after the pro promulgation of the constitution, our judges should have been taken through the technical aspects of the constitution. And up to now, there is need for a proper <coughs> training of our judges on chapter 7. What it entails, what it, it anticipates. Because when you look at the judgments that have come out, especially in presidential uh, petitions, you find a very frustrating uh, lack of understanding by the judges of the technical issues in chapter 7 and the same for chapter 12 on public finance we just we are just litigating we just a judgment from the high court and if you read it you really you really sob at the level of ignorance displayed by the judges in their judgment in terms of not understanding what the issues are but these are technical chapters that required some form of proper training of the judges on not just to assume that because somebody has been in law school, he has practiced law, he therefore can sit and in judgment over these two very technical uh, chapters in the Constitution. Mm. And I hope that those who are responsible for the judiciary 
will take the time to have the people train the judges. You saw the other day, these talks at Bomas, the Supreme Court made their presentation on Article 140. Mm. And they were saying that the time given to them, the 14 days for them to determine mm. a petition, mm. are uh, too short mm. or are inadequate. Now, you'd find that the architecture in which they are thinking is they're thinking of paper elections, mm. manual elections. But when you look at the architecture in uh, Chapter 7, you cannot just try a paper election because the threshold is tamper proof. Mm. It's no longer free and fair. Like if you go to Article 81 of the Constitution, mm. you look at uh, 81D. Principles of the electoral uh, ele of the election there. It gives you the broad principles which the election has to have. It talks of universal suffrage, mm -hmm. fair representation, equality of the vote, and stuff like that. Equality of the vote and every vote must count. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. When you've got 19 million votes, how do you guarantee that every vote has counted manually? Even in the counting process, somebody can miscount. Mm. We're not doing it manually. Mm. So every vote may not count there. Uh, when you come down, you'll find that if you go to section E, it gives you, it gives you that you, the, 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 the voting has to be by secret ballot. That we do. Uh, free from violence, intimidation, improper influence, and whatever. I don't know that we do that. Conducted by an independent body. IBC is an independent body. Mm. Transparent, it's never transparent. You can never know what is going on. Administered in an impartial, neutral, efficient, accurate, accountable manner. Now, why would you use the word impartial and neutral in the same sentence? Mm. A human being can be impartial, mm -hmm. but a human being can never be neutral. Mm. It's only something that's in uh, impersonal that can be neutral. Mm -hmm. Because when they be so official to vote, they have got their preferences. So they can only vote and say, okay, shall be impartial, shall not interfere with anything, but let us vote. But to be neutral, for an electoral system to be neutral, it is telling you something. It's beginning to care towards digitalization of the elections. Mm. So that when the process is now running out, it's, a, in, in partial, it's, it's, it's not neutral. It's neutral. Then uh, you go to the voting system. You are told that uh, whatever voting me method, the system has to be simple. Simple for who? Huh? For simple the voter. for who? For the voter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Number two, it has to be accurate. Mm. It has to be verifiable. By who? Who verifies it? Huh? Mm -hmm. It has to be secure, it has to be accountable, and it has to be transparent. Now, when you are running a vote, uh, well, like the last election, we had 19 million registered voters. Mm -hmm. Even me, where I voted, I cannot verify my vote. Once you drop that vote there in the ballot, Quisha, you cannot verify what you voted for. But the technologies exist. Look at countries like Brazil and India. Mm. They've got what you call a voter verified paper audit trail. You vote digitally. It gives you a serial number. You can go on the website of the electoral body and verify that your vote was really assigned to the candidate you voted for. Essentially track your vote. You can track your vote. Yeah. Verifiable. Mm. So you come and find that uh, when you talk of, of accurate... And the level of accuracy in the, this election is very high. So no longer free and fair. We talk of tamper proof. Mm. Accurate. What's the level of accuracy that is required? In Kenya, you win an, ele you win an election by one ballot. Mm. Be it an MCA, to the 100 votes, what some one person goes 99 votes, the other one goes 100 votes. The person who got 100 votes wins. Yeah. So the level like, of accuracy is one vote. And the higher you go, the more the demand on accuracy, because the even the presidential election 
is determined by 51 Plus percent one vote. and one vote. Mm. Yeah. So in 19 million votes, the IEBC is supposed to ensure that they've got a, the, ballot, the results they give us are accurate to one vote. That cannot be done manually. It's impossible. So it must be a digital election. That's what we are looking for. Now, when you have this digital, digital election architecture and you understand it, you'll also find that in our constitutional structure, you don't have spoiled ballots. Why don't you have spoiled ballots? Because when it's a simple election, if I am, uh, let us say, people earn low income like security guards, I'm a security guard working in Mombasa. I want to go and vote for my brother who's an MCA in Matayos mm. or in Mandera. Mm. Today, you must save, you must travel to go and cast your vote. But if it's a simple election for the voter, you would simply go to the voting booth and that Kim's kit, you click on it, you select the electoral, the vote to the ward where you want to vote, the candidates pop up on the screen, you select your candidate, and it's taken, and as it goes down, it's also removed from the natural database. So that, you know what you have now? We have got the database, but it's like having an having a pesa putting your money in an pesa and then being told you are in Mombasa, okay, travel to Busia to go and withdraw it. Arrant mm -hmm. nonsense. So, we need to make this thing simple, verifiable. Now, when you come back to accuracy, the one ballot that is important, that one ballot must be accounted for, must be transparently de demonstrated. And that can only be realized through a digital election. And so when the judges are given 14 days, the architecture is digital. Hmm. So when, you are given, when I'm given seven days to make up my case as a petitioner, right. and the judges 14 days, right. the architecture is, is uh, digital, so everything is here. So the problem then is not even with the judiciary. No, it is in no, one no. way. Mm. Let me get why, why it is. Because yeah. in Raila 1, mm. the Supreme Court made a declaration that is totally, totally, totally difficult to comprehend. Which one is Raila 1? 2013? Yes. Mm. There was a provision there that technology is unreliable. Technology fails. Technology is not unreliable. Technology never fails. Except when it encounters one of the three or a combination. Incompetence, negligence, or sabotage. That's when the technology fails. If I go to my car and I, can't, I crank and it doesn't start, that doesn't mean technology has failed. It could mean I've not serviced my battery. It could mean I don't know how to start a car. Or it could mean somebody has snipped the wires. You see? Mm. So that's that is a declaration by the Supreme Court that technology does not work. Mm. It needs to be retracted. So that's so as to justify the elections. Number two, the Supreme Court also entertained something called spoiled ballots. Mm. I don't know if you remember the fight over spoiled ballots. Mm. Yep. It says they don't work. Why did the Supreme Court get that? In the Constitution, there's no spoiled ballot because the electoral uh, structure mm. is digital. So they begin creating problems and that's why I said there was need to take our judges through the technical aspects yeah. of Article 8 uh, of, the, of Chapter Seven. Seven. You need to do that. And so, who take them through this? There are people who have so many experts in this country. The people who design that chapter, <laughs> there are so many experts S in this Say they country. do it, but you still go ahead and have a manual election and you come before them. Now, once, once, once they have done that yeah. and they declare in manual election and, uh, and a null and void, nobody will hold a, 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 a manual election in this country. Mm. To eliminate the cost of printing papers, eliminate the need for having all these so-called agents, eliminate all these things, and all people would require to do. But why doesn't the constitution just say digital election or electronic No, it election? cannot say digital election. Why it not? Says, no, because we, technology changes. Yeah, why? It says whatever system will be used. Tomorrow, we might have chips in our minds. So we can vote by just thinking. So why does the constitution not expressly say <coughs> have a technological Yes, because election. it doesn't say that because it says, it says whatever system is used. Including manual? No. It says whatever but system... does it is, exclude manual? No, it doesn't exclude. It says whatever system it is used should achieve the following thresholds. Now, those thresholds... Cannot be achieved manually. Cannot be achieved manually. But, but in be. the future, uh, beyond technology today, digital, we might, come, we might invent something better than digital, and so we use it. It say, the constitution sets the floor 
It doesn't set the ceiling. And the paper manual does not make it to the floor. I hear you expressing frustration here with the judiciary. Well, I'm, I think I'm just, I'm not, not frustration, I think uh, it's concern. But as all other things we need to, I think we need to build momentum outside of the structures. Mm -hmm. I think this is, a, this is an area where you need to have direct engagement. You go back to chapter to article one mm -hmm. and deal with the people directly. And we are planning on that. We want to do serious civic education mm -hmm. on chapter one, on any chapter seven, mm -hmm. so that we can make it impossible for anybody to hold a paper election in this country, a manual election in this country. And I think we are starting it this year. We want to do a proper, to get people to understand really what is the architecture of chapter one. And this architecture runs throughout the constitution. Mm. Talk about referenda. They tell you how to present a million signatures. First of all, IBS doesn't have a capacity a to verify even a single signature. But mm -hmm. even if they had, any institution, give them a million signatures to verify, it will simply crash. They, they need uh, several years. Mm. So, but if it's a digital network, then people just present their biometrics. If those who collect the signatures have got a, are given the gadgets to collect the signatures for referenda bi biometrically, it is something that should be done in a day. Right now, they don't verify those signatures. They just play around and say, okay, we have seen that the IDs are there. Mm. They look at the IDs instead. Mm -hmm. But the consumer requires you to verify the signature because I can impose myself using somebody's ID. Mm. Mm. So the requirement for a digital electoral system is there. And even if you go further, the question of public participation in Article 10, which basically requires us to hold referenda on issues, can be easily done if we have a digital voting system. Then a question is posed in Parliament and people will throw their ideas there. And then there's direct participation and then mm. there is also the other way. So unless we implement that, it's going to be a cock-up in our elections. Yeah. The standard is tamper-proof in the constitution but the ibc is working towards free and fair which was seen that free and fair is impossible in a culture like ours mm. okay so that's an interesting point senator because what i wanted to ask now if the constitution states tamper proof yes. right that means now we're looking at the element of manipulation by humans yes right because there's error which yes. is normal which is natural but yeah. then there's manipulation yes. which is then intentional Yes. So when the Constitution in Chapter 7 talks about tamper proof, what we're trying to say that the elimination of this human manipulation then becomes what you're after. Yes, what you're after. And are we saying then that this digital process then is what is going to deliver this tamper proof scenario that the Constitution envisages? Yes, and for one reason. Hmm. You can tamper with the elections. You can even program them to cheat. Mm. But the difference between them and the people who cheat in the dark rooms is that they will say we are cheating. When you open the server and you look, the algorithm will be there saying we are cheating, mm. we are cheating, mm. we are cheating. And that's how the tamper proof is achieved. So if any human interference to tamper, we'd simply open the server and it will be exposed. It will leave a trail. It will leave a trail. So that's the beauty of using these digital machines. And that's why they become tamper proof. Mm -hmm. And you see like the question of prompt declaration. Mm. When you take seven days to declare the presidential election, is that prompt? <laughs> well, in the larger scheme of things, yeah. In Brazil, the other day in Brazil, <laughs> the other day in Brazil, they held an election of about 500 million voters. How long did they take them to announce? How long was it? Less than an hour after the last ballot was cast. And the election stood and they said, anybody has any questions, I'll do that. They, ra they, ran, uh, they, ran, they ran digital elections from 88. They've been running electoral elections. They've hardly reached the judiciary to adjudicate at an electoral dispute. They go administratively and look at where the concern is. They have got a system that, before election, they even invite hackers. They give a prize for hackers to hack it. Mm. And this hacking thing, look at Safaricom. Has any Mpesa, has it ever been hacked? Why has it never been hacked? So people will come and say, when you do elections, they're going to be hacked, they're going to be whatever. Why has Mpesa never been hacked? Yet it carries billions of shillings on that platform. Do we know? It has never been hacked. It would be know? in the air. Maybe there have been attempts. Do we know? There would be attempts will always be there, yeah. but it has not been hacked. The Brazilian system, they even offer a price mm. for hackers to hack it. They never hack it. For it to be tested. Yeah, for it to be tested, yeah. So the technology is there, mm. everything is there, mm. but the political will is not there. The That's politicians it. want mm -hmm. 
and this is on both sides yeah all politicians want a chance want. to tamper with the elections and our, if you look at the curricular report mm. the verdict was that you Kenyans your culture cannot allow you to have a free and fair election <laughs> <laughs> you just need to have a system that lock, prevents you from rigging mm. <laughs> You need to be prevented from rigging. Because that, it sounds as though there's a natural inclination to yeah. go towards that. And so what you need is something that will stop. Will stop you. That from happening. Yeah, that from happening. And that's why mm. an, a meditation, a real reflection on chapter 7 mm. is important for this country. That's when we shall be able to manage how power is acquired mm. and retained. So the Mjadala then would be on that particular issue. And what you're saying is because we know that politicians will hardly, by their own will and volition, lead us in that direction. They need to be, to be, you know, chaperoned and shepherded towards that direction. And one of the institutions to do that would be the judiciary. If the judges looked at it and they all said the best journey for this country is this digital, and there are provisions in this constitution that point us towards that line of digital, then let's go to the extreme and go digital. If the judges of the court, of the Supreme Court, for example, said an election in Kenya is technology. And yeah, that, that paper is that, not technology. That would be one way of making that sure would, that well, the That would be the simplest. But then that will, will bring in another mjadala. No, it won't. It won't it bring in. No, but the, the, the text is there. The only thing, the, the only thing that the judges made, you know, when 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 the uh, uh, Supreme Court says that technology is not okay, technology does not work, technology fails. Technology never fails. And as I've demonstrated, unless it meets incompetence, ignorance, or sabotage, technology never fails because they lose, even the even the planet runs on the same laws that you run on technology and it's the laws of physics. So it doesn't fail. So the only thing, that declaration, we going forward will, will need to be revisited. And for me, when you see the judges complaining about the number of days, then they have not understood what, what the architecture in the place is. They need to go and maybe be given us a, a baseline tour of, the, of uh, Brazil. And incidentally, Brazil, the elections are handled by the judiciary. Because the fellows were so... It's the Electoral Commission. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they choose the Electoral Commission, whatever they do, is from the judiciary. Mm. And the one which came up with these digital elections. Because there used to be a big mess in that place. And from 1988, they cleaned up and have been running very, very good elections. And this technology then morphed up into places like India, which have developed results of quite a bit. Now, the mistake IBC does, IBC goes to France. When did France hold a, a digital election? Canada. When did the governor of Canada hold a digital election? Are we saying they don't know all this? The information that you're talking about, are we saying that the judici no, the Judiciary the Electoral Commission are not aware that Brazil has taken these giant leaps when it comes to managing the elections? Or are we saying that is that is what they have chosen simply to demonstrate that they have done some benchmarking? I don't know what has happened, but you see, the problem could be a bit deeper because when, even if you, when you go to the law, the IBC commissioners, eh? how they are chosen. Eh? Mm. You, saw, you saw in the last the other, the election before the last, one name came very prominent. Unfortunately for the late Musando, mm. he came in very prominently. What level was Musando? He was a, he was a junior manager. Yeah. You go on the IBC, let's assume the Chebukati Commission, mm. the amount of skills in, mo in the kind of IT, IT that is required can fit well on the back of a postage stamp in big print. <laughs> so you even need to make the law, even need to amend that law. We need to amend that law so that we require special skills in databases among the commissioners. Not just lawyers and whatever. We need people who understand IT to be among the commissioners. The but, law needs to provide for but that. But you politicians have made it that, that, that you're the ones who are going to appoint yes, the commissioners. Yes, the ones who decide. You do not want these things yes, to happen. Yes, let them decide, but let the requirement be mm. that bring people who understand this and that. 
And I'm telling you, the moment it's required, a lord will bring them. It looks as though we just seem to be having a cat chasing his tail kind of issue here. Because we talk about what is needed. We talk about what the Constitution says. We talk about the need for the implementation of the Constitution along the lines which you said. And somebody's asked an interesting question, which I'd like you to, to talk about as well, where it says, why should we always hide behind the Constitution? So let that burn for a while. But then here we talk about the things that need to be done. And I'm really stuck on who then is responsible for this implementation that we speak of. We have a legislative body in the name of parliament, which is supposed to do some of these things. We have an executive body who is then supposed to make sure that all of these things fall into place. But it's so everybody's looking at the other or not even looking at it at all and realizing that it is important for this thing to happen. Yes. You have asked a very important question, and the, and the salvation, the answer is in Article 1. Mm. Article 1, that's where the people can exercise their power directly, or they can uh, delegate it. And when the, dele the power is delegated and it's not being used well, the people can recall that delegation. Mm. And that's why I was saying that, starting this year, we want to concentrate on two chapters in the Constitution, which we feel that if implemented, this country will be liberated. That's Chapter 7 and chapter 12 of the constitution chapter 7 on how elections are people are elected into power and chapter 7 how how many ta our taxes are used mm -hmm. like you find that with the treasury being part of the executive when you look at article 225 one the treasury and the minister of finance are two distinct bodies mm -hmm. but when parliament in 2012 was enacting uh, in 2013 was you know in 2012 was doing the public finance management act they retained the old system, whereby the Minister for Finance is in charge of the Treasury, and because the President appoints the Minister for Finance, therefore the President owns the Treasury, mm -hmm. and he can, use, he can go around the country declaring, we are going to put a road of 200 million here, 400 million here, 500 million here, from where? Because he's carrying the Treasury in his pocket. But if we do what the Constitution requires, and separate the Treasury from the Executive, so that he also has to go and beg for money, to do his projects, yep. then we shall, the budget will mean, have a meaning. Otherwise, why do you pass a budget and the president runs all over the country making, declaring his own budget that is in his head <laughs> with no reference to the budget that parliament passed? You see? So that, that's why I'm saying that we need to concentrate on chapter 12 and seven. chapter 7. And that will sort out this country completely once we implement those two chapters. This business of saying that we need to create laws to create a lead of opposition, do whatever, whatever, is arrant nonsense. Senator, I have to take you back a little bit. This matter of there needing to be some knowledge infused into the judiciary, and you said there are enough experts who can actually do that within the country. Yes. Do you think the judiciary is aware that they lack this knowledge? I don't know if they are aware that they lack this knowledge, but are, are they, from their own pronouncements, they lack it. When they say that they expand the time for us to look at the case, mm. it means they have not understood the architecture. That is used in article in chapter seven so there's that clear when they declare that technology does not work or that the technology fails honestly to any scientist tell him that technology fails then why would you be in a plane flying a thousand of meters away because it fails that's why flights are grounded by the no they get grounded when there's negligence when there's ignorance mm. or there's sabotage which causes what but you Failure. can deal with those, those are human those are human elements mm. dealing with technology you can deal with those elements of negligence incompetence and uh, sabotage you can address those but don't pronounce that technology fails technology never fails it is yeah. human beings who fail okay. to apply technology mm. and so we need proper mm. training and proper discipline and people with technology as go that's why people are able to go up to the they went up to the moon and came back the arm of government you belong to, how does it relate to the arm of government that we refer to as the judiciary? I ask this because there's a gentleman who heads the Judiciary uh, Academy. That is where judges go to brush up their knowledge and probably mm. infuse now. I asked about the relationship because if you have this awareness and you know and you can understand it, should this academy not be the sort of place where such knowledge is then passed on? I feel like that, that, uh, that's the way it should be. But you see, in Parliament, a lot of things are largely transactional. And 90% of the work we do is useless. 
Sorry. 90% of the work we do in parliament is useless. Meaning? We, have, we spend a lot of time doing statements. We spend a lot of time doing uh, motions. Mm. You even see that, uh, even uh, just uh, talk of motions. What went, what went on along in the uh, bombers was a motion. Mm. Okay? The whole process began as a motion in the National Assembly. Mm. It came to Parliament, we made it a motion. But when, but when you go to Article 109 of the Constitution, it tells you that the legislative authority of Parliament is exercised through bills introduced in the Parliament, uh, passed by Parliament, and signed by the President. Yes. So what was going to know what was going on in bombers he had no legislative authority and if i wanted to, to, to scramble it i would just go to court and say where 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 was the bill that allowed the bombers uh, the negotiations to begin for you to begin spending public funds you see there's a, there's a lot of uh, so so these things <laughs> so let me just finish so mm. when you say that so when you come back we have that uh, legislation which we need to do but even the legislation power right now in the, in the, the parliament have joined i don't know the previous but the ones have joined the power in parliament is outside the parliament meaning uh, the, the, the the members of the ruling uh, party or those who are affiliated with it behave like they are the, the executive mm. the others behave like they're the opposition outside parliament mm. so they look to their principles for guidance there is no autonomy in the house to say that this is the house this is how we are going to deal with things. We have got you know, an opposition within this house. We have got the lead of majority and we have got the lead of minority. How do we engage as an institution to make sure we check the executive? So all of us, both sides are looking outside the parliament for guidance. So basically there's no parliament. We have ideals, but we are not nowhere close to those ideals. Yes, but you have to work towards them. We have to. But then we have to have an, that honest conversation then. How do we have that honest conversation when there's so many other interests that are pulling us away from the ideal? I think the thing is to bite small and chew finely so that you don't get constipation. That's why we are going just to bite two chapters out of the many chapters <laughs> in, the, in the Constitution and chew them finely. Mm. Another thing I might just want to impress you with, you've had something called the gender rule. Mm. Yeah. Do you know in the entire constitution there is no word gender rule? Mm. It was another creation of the Supreme Court. What is there? The gender principle. That's what we have. Yeah. It's gender principle. And the principle is expressional. A rule is mandatory. You have to obey. So when the Supreme Court twisted the, from the gender principle to the gender rule, they again created another problem for us. So we begin said implement the gender rule and the rule has to be obeyed. But in the constitution there is no gender rule. Look at Article 28, 27 close, uh, Article 27, Clause 8. It's a gender principle. Article 81, it's a gender principle. Where does the word gender rule come from? And it, it has captured everybody's so fighting. So principle means aspirational. It's aspirational. It's principle. Without any timeline. No timelines on but the, the Constitution puts timelines. Where? The Constitution says, for example, that if Parliament is not constituted this way, that uh, someone can go to court immediately. When you interpret it as a gender rule, then you get that problem. But as gender principle, you don't get there. True. And now, when you come to judicial craft on that particular issue, there was judicial craft which gave us the, the phraseology gender rule. Mm. But you realize these things were there during the review momentum, when, when they were doing judicial review. The people, for whatever reason, allowed it for the national for the county assemblies to have that uh, balance with the assemblies but for the national institution they removed it you see just the same way with the and, and me i'm a textualist just the same way with the the question of uh, homosexuality it was there only it was proposed during the review for me. Mm -hmm. the people removed it so how would a judge today sit down and address homosexuality he should tell us that that's a political issue, take it to parliament. If you want it, they've seen the people rejected in the, <laughs> in the process of review, take it to parliament and let now parliament deal with it. It cannot be introduced through the judiciary. The same thing with the gender issues. It was clearly removed from the proposal mm -hmm. and they said the National Assembly will be like this and the accommodation was we shall have nominations. Like in the Senate, we have got about 20 nominations. We have 16 of which are women. Yeah. 
to address the question of gender. Yeah. So you cannot then come up and say that parliament as it is today yeah. is not properly constituted. But when you go and they introduce the word gender rule out there in Article, uh, in article uh, 27, Clause 8, and in Article 81, then it begins becoming a problem. There's a rule here. How are you obeying it? But is that not the problem that we get when a matter goes to court and that is the interpretation? It's a good example we are giving. It went to court, they interpreted it that way. So it, are we it, challenging it, the interpretation? It went to court through an advisory by Gidumigai. Mm -hmm. An advisory by Gidumigai mm -hmm. who went to the Supreme Court to, to seek. seek an advisory mm -hmm. yeah. and he asked the question will the gender rule he begins the word the gender rule. Oh, he mm. began with yes. us, with introducing the, the word gender, gender rule. rule. Will the gender rule be applied at the 2013 elections or later? You see? Yep. And now, now that's how now the debate begins. But the normal way that the judiciary functions, you begin in the high court, which is adversarial. And you see this is adversarial. And this are, uh, in fact, I tried to join that particular motion mm. when when they made the advisory. Mm. I was thrown out because I was, not, I, was not, I was not an institution. But mm. interestingly, that time I was using a lawyer. My lawyer, Kanjama, because of what we had, the, the predicts we had made, the court felt they were so important that they retained my lawyer. Now, how do you retain my lawyer after throwing me out? Because he can bring value to the court. Mm. He could bring value to the court, but I could not fight because at the same day, that evening, that the day I was attacked and left for dead in the street of Nairobi, mm. that evening. But you find that now they take my lawyer, then they, they, they drop me, and yet it was me who was instructing my lawyer what to go and say. You see. It was not my lawyer who was instructing me. Yes. You see. So in that end, they were doing that advisory. I looked at it and I went to, to bring those protestations, but I was locked out. So if this matter had begun in the High Court, and then of course again the Supreme Court in under somehow in a cut and paste. They went and cut something from Wikipedia, put in that uh, the advisory, <laughs> the advisory number one, and made it mandatory that from Nauru, something called Nauru, some principality, now we are, they made it mandatory that that advisory opinion binds all the courts, you see. So in that particular case, there's a problem. But if they had allowed that their advisory is for whomever, whomever they're advising, but they allow the citizens to litigate this matter, from the High Court, then all these things that I'm talking about will be ventilated so that by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, it is so distilled, you cannot have those errors being made. Mm. The citizens whom Chapter 1 gives the authority to do precisely yes. what you've just said. Yes, and those uh, are among the things we need to, to look at. As we conclude, so, Senator, yes. what is it that you're asking Kenyans to do today and this year, 2024? So you're saying focus on Chapter 7, Chapter 12. Yes, that's my, my prayer. And, and do what with those chapters? Make sure that we are able to control how power is acquired in this country and we also control how our public finances are used by those who are in power. That's the ultimate challenge. How do, we, how do we ensure that that happens? Once the people understand what's in those chapters, they will demand them. So that's why I think the route for this is direct to the people, go back to the people, get the people to understand this, and then we move forward and make demands. On those, uh, so that we can influence the legislation and all those things. Mm. And then we get to a point whereby the treasury is independent of the politicians, the public funds are managed by technocrats, yeah. and the politicians can't misuse it. Mm. <laughs> Number two, elections are digital, human beings cannot interfere. Where there's any dispute, we open the servers and everybody comes and looks at it. Mm. We don't even go to the judiciary. Mm. We finish our things administratively. Open That's the server, check the issue. Yeah. Move on. Move on. Yeah. Do you think we can do this by 2027? Yes, we are. And we are going to do it. By 2027? Yes, we, should. we are going to do it. Thank you. Senator Okio Mtata is a senator for Busia County. He's been our guest this morning as we begin Thank the new you. year. He's begun on that high note. He says, Kenyans, guys, we should be having digital elections. And Kenyans, that guy who is the Minister for Finance should not be the head of the National the Treasury. Treasury. Those two should be different. Yeah. Think about that. Thank you, Senator. Um, this is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.